G'day, on this week's Straight Talk, I got my good friend, long time survivor of cancer and probably the best sales training person in this country. He's totally booked out all the time, all the time. And his name's Tom Panos. Now, in this discussion, I'm gonna to talk to him about what are the key mistakes that salespeople, or anybody by the way, who's not in trying to be a salesperson, but in their business are selling, what are the key mistakes they make? And then I wanna talk about what are the irrefutable laws of closing a sale. If you don't understand them and you don't engage with them and you don't practice them, you won't make a sale. And if you are doing it, you gotta keep reminding yourself of what it is you're doing well. Tom is gonna to take us through those laws of selling. This guy's a genius. As far as I'm concerned, he is the number one guy in the country to listen to when it comes to selling. Check it out now on mentor.com.au. Well, welcome to Straight Talk. Um, so as you know, you guys, I don't stuff around um, and I want to bring you the very best of what I know and who I know in whatever the industry might be. To my left, let me introduce you to Tom Panos. Tom Panos, as far as I'm concerned, and many, many others, is for sure the number one real estate sales training guy in this country. And uh, he's got lots of accolades behind him to prove that to be the case. So welcome, Tom. Thank you, Mark. Um, so I'm a big Tom Panos fan. And real estate training is about training real estate agents to have the right mindset and know how to sell real estate. And probably it's probably a bit more complicated than that. We're going to talk about that in a second. I want to say this. Uh, we, you know, we always talk about that concept of resilience. Um, you know, another word for it is fucking grit. You know, grit. Um, we all talk about it. We all talk ourselves up. You know, we all think we got it. But at the end of the day, you know, we get tested. That's when you really know if you got it or not. I just saw something very interesting from um, um, Mike Tyson. He says um, he said something along the lines that uh, there's lots of people out there get behind you know, Instagram, the various social mediums, and they're saying a whole lot of stuff. But until you get punched in the face, you don't really know what it's like to be resilient or to be tough. Um, well, this guy's been punched in the face, um, metaphorically speaking, because Tom has suffered from cancer. Mm. For a I, long time. Yeah. So, Mark, uh, and I think it's in this office here, I began my chemotherapy journey one day after I came in here. And it was in 2006 when I was doing a project which you were kind enough to, to give your time called Winners in Business. And, uh, Mark, I was diagnosed uh, back in, uh, I was in my mid-30s and I was diagnosed. It was, uh, I was told it was incurable, stage four lymphatic cancer. I went on a clinical trial. It worked to everyone's surprise, but then it came back out of the blue in 16, because when you're on a trial, you don't know what's gonna happen. And then I recovered again, and then it came back in 18, and then I recovered again, but in between the 16 and 18, my youngest brother, you know, 41, he passed away, a uh, different illness. So, you know, you talk about punches in the face. I just felt like they just, like, I just didn't want to pick up the phone at one stage because I'm thinking everything's bad news. It's one punch after the other. But Mark, you know, it's 2020, I'm sitting next to you and I've got to tell you, some of the best gifts in life come badly wrapped. Why you, you know, you, as, as Tyson's has said, you, you grow a, in the suffering is when you grow resilience. In the suffering and the pain, you actually say, hang on a second, I've done this, I've got through this. And that helps you because when you're, when you're down in the valley, right, a lot of people numb themselves with Valium and booze. But for me, in the valley has been where I've learnt, you know, how much you can endure. And you said to me, you said to me in 2006, when I was interviewing you, there was a Greek ornament um, with uh, 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 two testicles on there. And as you said, metaphorically, you talked about the fact is you need that. You've got to have balls. And for me, courage to me is probably the unique superpower you need to succeed in business and in life. And we've all got it. We've got it. We just have to look for it. We have to dig deep and find it. But we've all got it. I mean, and, and, and the metaphor still sticks to this very day. And if, you, like, if you're talking about resilience, 
You look remarkably well at the moment, Tom. I saw, I did see some vision of you maybe 18 months ago, and you didn't look too good to me. Um, yeah. And I was actually very concerned about you, but you look you look very good. I'm very happy that you're sitting here, and I'm very you. glad you got through it again. Thank you. Um, and but these are all testaments to, or testimony to Tom's uh, grit and his resilience. And we, t I just wanted to quickly say because it's really important to me to um, uh, highlight this. Um, resilience is the ability to endure suffering, appreciate what you got, understand what you don't have, accept it, and just get on, get on with it. Get on with the fucking thing, and uh, and and not whinging. Like a lot of you guys out there would be thinking to yourselves right now, COVID, COVID, COVID. Particularly my friends in Victoria and all, all the people who listen to me in Victoria, COVID's killing me. It's killing my business. It's not fair. It's, cancer's not fair. It's definitely not fair. But it's not about what's not fair, is it? Listen, someone said to me this morning, Tom, we're going to go into stage four lockdown in Melbourne. There's a client of mine in Melbourne. I've got Melbourne, Sydney's where most of them are. I said, listen, Michael, stage four lockdown is better than stage four cancer, right? Put on your mask, right? I've seen people have masks. You put on your mask, it's not the end of the world, yeah. you know? So just be very, very clear. And he didn't say anything back to me because I think he realises that when you compare one thing to another, you say, hang on a second, right? So what? So what have you lost? You can't do an auction. You can't do an open for inspection. Well, you can still meet a buyer at a property, right? You can still do an online auction. And quite frankly, you don't really need an auction to sell a property. You've got a buyer you got a seller, you put them together, do a deal, right? Yeah, 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 <laughs> 100%. And by the way, it's not that tough. I mean, what, what will be tough, though, in the real estate industry is that you might find a lot less inventory available for sale. But as you and I, I just talked to Tom, and Tom's got, like, he has an audience tonight. He puts out a video, 35,000 real estate agents across Australia. Yeah. We'll watch it. Like, that's a pretty big following, particularly for one segment. Um, and we just did a discussion about, you know, what I would do or what people do when – there's less transactions and when there's less transactions you just got to be better than the bloke next to you are getting the, the transactions that are that are available so you've got to get a bigger share of a smaller market that means you've got to work harder work longer work smarter work better um, and you've got to understand in terms of real estate at least how to sell so what i want to talk to you about today tom is the art of selling and, it, and maybe there's some signs too but selling is quite an elusive thing for many people many people for example can't ask mm. do you mind giving me your property for sale so a lot of people can't ask to ask that question or do you mind would you like to buy this and that you come in the shop you're coming to buy that oh but by the way have you, have you got have you got enough antibacterial lotion i mean what is the art of selling just in a general sense i don't mean tell me, i'm not asking for the skills but what do you see this this world of selling as to me the world of selling is basically you making it easy for someone to say yes on something that's good for them. And for that reason, you shouldn't be scared to say, hey, have you got any of this? Because if I think that that's good for you, I should make it easy for you to say yes. So one of the real problems in selling is if in your heart you think that's bullshit, that's not good for you, that's when you have a problem, when you don't have belief in yourself or your product. When you believe in it, Mark, I've got to tell you, you'll come across as a Scientologist telling another person why you should join Scientology. It's, it's like electricity. It goes from one person to another. So having belief is critical. So is there some psychology associated with this? I mean, what, like, is there something that you've studied or you've read or is it just, just based on your experience or something you've... You know, in the darkest hours of your chemotherapy, did you just lay there and did it become a, you know, a light switch went on and told uh, someone telling you this? I mean, tell me how okay. you work this stuff out. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a hybrid educator in the sense that I do believe in a bit of academic evidence-based stuff, right? You can't just have someone just, you know, preaching their own thoughts with no um, evidence to it. So I do like to have the combination of what I see being street smart tactics that are working out there in the field, then coupled with some academic rigor. Great book, Influenced by Dr. Robert Caldini. That's what it's called, Influence. Influence. So what this guy did is he went in as part of his PhD um, and would go in undercover 
and go through sales training programs, insurance companies, real estate companies, and he would go off and become a, a candidate and a graduate and do all those courses. And then he went off and he studied, why is it that some people have the ability to influence another person? And there's around five or six techniques that if you use them with good intent, you become a super salesperson, a trusted advisor. If you use them with bad intent, you're a con man. Right. They work for both, right? Yeah. But some people use it to, to rip a business partner off or rip thousands of people. Others use it to become a $500 million broker or a you know, $10 million real estate agent, right? So you know some of those, and we won't spend the whole time in our conversation doing an analysis of the bookmark, but some of these techniques are you know, social proof. Here's an example. If you go do an inspection on a property at four o'clock and you take a buyer and they see there's another buyer sitting outside at 4.15 and there's another buyer sitting outside the property at 4.30, all of a sudden, this buyer says, this is valuable, right? There's others there. So that's social proof, what others are doing. An auction is a good example of that. At an auction, you've got a buyer and they're looking at other people bidding. There's social proof, they want it as well. Then there's another principle called scarcity. People want what they can't have. So that's the power of an auction. You're at an auction, someone says one million. They've got the bid. They've taken the property away from the underbidder, right? Scarcity, right? So there's a few principles, scarcity, social proof, authority. Why do we see some of these TV commercials that are selling toothpaste? A guy dressed with a white thing, looking like a dentist. Hey, it's an authority figure. A dentist is talking about it, right? So is that the auctioneer, though? Is it? Who's the authority figure in an auction for our sake? In, in, oh, let's talk about it in, in an auction. An authority figure automatically an auctioneer gets put up on a pedestal for some reason. I, and literally, you mean actually put up on a box above everybody? You're, you're, you're above. You're, you're, you're there. You're, you're sitting there, Mark. And ironically, the real estate agent's done all the work. But for whatever reason, Mark, when you're the centerpiece, you look like you've got the authority. You're the person that the vendor says, oh, how do you think we're, we're going to go, right? TV does it as well. You know mm. from TV. TV gives you automatic authority, yep. you know? Um, so we know authority is, is, is another example, right? So what, that, what does that mean? If you're a mortgage broker, if you're in pharmaceutical sales, if you're in media sales, if you're a real estate person, you want to get known as the authority in the marketplace and have what I call eminence. It's an interesting word, eminence, Mark. Eminence, if you Google it in a modern dictionary, it says someone who has superiority amongst their peers. So eminence is really important because if you've got eminence in an industry, you're on the shopping list, right? Um, That's interesting. Can I just, just just go back a track now? So we've got, um, we've got uh, authority. Yeah. In other words... Um, and that's a physical thing uh, from what you're explaining, for example, when it comes to an auction. But uh, let's say I'm standing behind the counter of a, you know, a shop. Yeah. The, your, your authority is the fact that you're standing behind the counter in your shop. You might be appropriately attired and you might be able to... Uh, your authority comes from the way you address people, the way you look at them, the way you conduct yourself, the way you hold yourself. You know, like you've got, you've got to look healthy, well, smartly dressed or appropriately dressed. Eminence is where social media comes in, you know, you're establishing yourself as someone who knows what they're talking about in relation to a particular industry. industry. Scarcity, well, there's, there's a few little, they're, they're quite little uh, interesting little techniques and games you play, but scarcity is quite an important thing because, you know, we're going to run out. There's no yeah. many left. These are all selling. There's only one left or three left. Scarcity. Toilet, toilet paper is an example. Good example. Yeah. yeah. You, well, we all perceive there was the scarcity of toilet paper when there wasn't. But, and, and what was the first one again? Social proof. Social proof. What, others, what are others doing? Yeah. Like yeah. an example, I went across the road to get a coffee. One, one coffee shop across the road had no one at the front. The other one had a group of people. Mm. Now, on the surface, you'd say, hang on a second, you don't want to waste time. But my head didn't work that way. I don't come here often. Mm. And I thought to myself, there's seven people there. That's social proof to me. That's that, better. That's better, right? So he, all of a sudden, you begin to see examples. As a salesperson, how do you bring these psychological techniques in to 
your business to help you move the dial your way. Yeah, so actually this guy's a genius because he's, he's actually putting – he's condensing things that work into one word. And, and it's a word that we all understand, scarcity, social but, proof, etc. But my favourite of all, the principles, Mark, is – this is good because I ha- didn't know the question, but it's made, I love thinking about things because it, you educate yourself along the way. You, yeah, you, yeah. Your brain goes back to textbooks. And My favourite is the law of reciprocity. The law of reciprocity says, hey, if they came over to our house and gave us a present, we've got a moral obligation. When I go to their house. To go to their house. And give them a present. Correct. If Australia helps America or America helps Australia, we got to do vice versa, right? That's the way it works. And that happens in sales all the time. Now, the biggest problem in sales is salespeople can't handle the lag between the behaviour of giving and getting. They've got this, they suffer with handling delayed gratification, like a mortgage broker. You know, they want to ring someone up and say, hey, you happy with your loan? Uh, you want to come over here? Instead of them sort of saying, give, 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 ring up, give them useful information, useful information, useful. That's reciprocity. There comes a time when this person feels, hey, this girl or guy's been really good. They're out servicing me. They're talking to me. They give- I owe them. I owe them. You know what? And if they're going to ask me, would it be okay that I talk to you about how I could actually give you a product that's going to save you a lot more money in the long run. Could I have 10 minutes of your time? They've got this moral obligation to listen to you, you know? So there's an example. And if you've got the product, and if you can do it and Cor- prove it, correct, you'll get the deal. Correct. Yes. 100%. So, and well, that's a very interesting point. So I just want to dwell on that, that last one, reciprocity. In other words, someone's going to – has the – the ethic of I need to reciprocate in the event that I want to transact. Yeah. So right now, um, let's say you're a mortgage broker or you're a real estate agent, um, and we talked about this earlier on, and you've got a client list. Yeah. Um, and you've got their email address and or their telephone number. Yeah. First base. Yeah. Would you email everybody and say, look, how are you going? It's Tom here. I, I haven't dealt, spoken to you for a while now, but I, I, I know you're in Victoria, Melbourne. I just want to know whether you're okay. And... Um, reach out to me, here's my mobile number, would you, what would you do? I'd pick up the phone. Yep. I'd say, hey. You'd ring them. I'd ring them. Hey, Mark, firstly, I want to apologise. It's Tom Panos here. I should have been in touch earlier. Start with a sorry. One of the hardest things you can do in life. I want to apologise. Secondly, I want to let you know, for us, it's business as usual in an unusual way. Is there any way I can help you at this time? That's it. Yep. That's it. No commission breath. No, mm-hmm. I've called you. Is there anything I can do to help you at this time? Mark, the girl or guy who makes the most call wins. And if you call and just sort of, you don't even have to be that good. You've just got to be there. You've just got to actually make the call. And I think that most people suffer because they don't take the shot. You miss 100% of the shots you don't take. Take the shot, right? Pick up the phone. And um, that would be the approach I would use. And don't, right don't try and sell them. He just gave you a script, by the way. I hope you, hope you write that down you know, or play it back because that's – Pretty full on. I mean, that's not you're not trying to sell them. You're not, they're not ringing up saying, "Hey, by the way, I can save you ten thousand dollars or three thousand dollars on your mortgage next year." You don't. You're not, they're not selling no. anything. No. Is there anything I can do for you right now? Is there anything you need help with? Correct. And and I and 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 I've got to say, Mark, if something's going to happen in business, they'll bring it up, and often they'll say, "What's happening in the market there?" And that's when you move on to the conversation. We've seen some really great low rates at the moment. That's your response. You got yeah. uh, what's that? Oh, well, some fantastic fixed rates out there at the moment. Yeah. And uh, oh, what, what's your current variable rate? You don't even have to know what it is. If you don't know, it's just fine. They might say it's 3.25. Oh, wow. Well, there's some fixed rates at the moment, 2.2. Would you be interested to know how much you can save? Yeah. Would you like me to do the calculation for you? Yeah. Make it easy. That's it. That's exactly right. So... So, and what would you do? Would you follow? Okay, we do that, and it's all. And they say, "Oh, thanks very much. You're giving them the information." How does the follow-up go then? Like, because you just said you got to be patient. You can't yeah. expect a return straight away. You got to yeah. you got to bank a bit. Yeah, you got to put a bit in the bank. Correct. So, what do you wait a week, two weeks, three weeks? The final sentence would be, "Okay, would it be a ridiculous idea that I stay in touch with you 
with anything that I think might be useful for you, right? It would be as simple as that. When they say yes, no one's going to say that's a ridiculous idea, right? No one's going to say, um, uh, no, don't stay in contact with them, right? What you do then is you put them into your ecosystem and your ecosystem is going to be a combination of telephone, text. I've got to tell you, texts are underrated. Texts work. Mm. You know that me and you communicate through text. Text matter, right? Has a higher open rate than an email, right? Text, phone, email. So then what you do is you put them into your ecosystem and then what you've got is what is called a database. And then what you have is a thing called a pipeline. And a pipeline are people in that database that are the most likely are going to do a deal at some point. So what smart people do, and you don't have to make it complicated, hot, medium, cold, or A, B, C, you segment them in your head, who's higher prob than the others. And then you block off every day. I've got a habit, Mark, that I've lived with. I live with it through chemo, believe it or not. I never went off this habit. It's called 10 calls before 10 a.m. every day. Make 10 phone calls. The power of that, that's 50 calls a week. That's 200 calls a month. That's 2,000 calls a year out of one simple habit. 10 calls before 10 a.m. So you put that into your structure of your day and all of a sudden you're in momentum and you stay in contact with those people and whenever you ring them up again, there's a law in sales called the law of because. And the law of because says when you start ringing people in your pipeline, you call with a purpose. Hey Mark, it's Tom Panos here. I know you're not doing anything in business at the moment, but the reason I'm calling is because. I move within nine seconds, I've said because, because I don't want to be wasting your time. Mark, I'm shocked. There's 2% rates, which basically means if you bought yourself something that was returning 5%, you're basically banking 3% in the bank. Would it be okay if I actually sent you some stuff over and we can chat over it? You, that you're sort of moving them along, right? So, um, yeah, that's that's pretty much the process. And I think, Mark... You sold me. I feel like ringing you up and finding out what it is that's giving you, going to give me I've a 5% return. got the paper Canberra. with Canberra. <laughs> I mean, Canberra's a good ex example. Yeah. I mean, like... I am shocked. The Canberra still has the lowest vacancy rate, has the highest um, rental yields in the market in, in in the country. Um, it has the fastest population growth. It has the lowest unemployment number in Australia, yeah. and I mean, and the most affordable houses. And what I mean by that is, you know, you don't have to pay millions of dollars. You can buy a very good, brand new apartment, state of the art, just built for four fifty, five hundred thousand dollars. And there's nowhere else in Australia we can get set like that. Um, and lenders like to live that. By the way, lenders know that's the sweet spot for us. 350 to 450,000 is yeah. where we want to lend. Yeah. That's the least amount of risk. It's our highest return. Yeah. It's the least amount of work. Yeah. We, we'd like a, the cost of getting the loan set up is the least amount because they're the least complicated people. We're not dealing with trust accounts and stuff like that. Um, so it's, it's very interesting it's territory. A, it's the greatest time, in, Mark, for me, it's the greatest time in the world that I've seen for mortgage brokers. Greatest time, and I'll tell you why. Bank incentives to move people over are pretty good. Yeah, like you can get $4,000 cash back now on refis. <laughs> right. and, and, and the rates are two fifty nine dollars or two two sixty. dollars Number two, people know the price of everything but know the value of nothing. The consumers are more confused than ever. So you just got to get a smart, sharp mortgage broker, get in front of someone, sit down, do a bit of an analysis, diagnose their problem like a doctor does, then give them, prescribe them a solution. This is a, this is a bloody great time to be a mortgage broker. It's a, it's a time that you can stand out from the pack. You know, we're going to look back and say that they were, they were golden days. And now that we've had, you know, validation from the government that the behaviour that the government had during that inquiry last year was appalling, they've sort of said it themselves now, right? More than ever, more than ever, this concept that you're going to drive to a bank, 
you know, spend two hours looking for parking, sit in front of a guy, a banker, crawl to them, will you give me some money? That game's over a long time ago. Your broker's going to meet you at your house, at the cafe. My broker used to come and meet me at the Qantas Lounge. I'd say, mate, I've got a flight there. He'd come over and he'd have the form filled out, just sign there, Panos, that's it, done. Mm. Banks don't do that. Yeah, and, and also, I mean, to be, to be honest with you, uh, the, they can all meet online too today. I mean, I can just have a conversation on Zoom, like you and I just had like about two hours yeah. ago. Like, you can, you can, uh, uh, even if you don't want to walk outside of your house yes. and we're in lockdown, you're yes. in Victoria or in Melbourne, main yes. time, we Zoom each other and talk, yes. talk over the phone. I can have the same conversation as long as the internet's not going to drop out, but I can have that conversation. I have a really good conversation with you and I can see your eyes and you can trust me and I yes. can trust you because for me, I like to talk to people face to face. Yes. Zoom's good. Yes. Um, this is the best, but if this is not available, Zoom's good. Your clients will like Zoom. I want to ask you, Tom, I mean, I, I, I can't go beyond getting someone to give me a view on real estate prices in yeah. this country, or is it not relevant because they'll bounce back in a year or two's time? I mean, it's, let's draw a line, say today, or no. So let's say this spring, which always is a big deal in Australia when it comes to real estate, what do you see prices doing? Because we're getting all sorts of stuff from CoreLogic and all these various experts, you know, Deloitte's and blah, blah, blah. What do you see is going on? I mean, what are you hearing? Look, so I run an auction business and I, and I do get involved with the auctions myself. I did 10 on Saturday, right? So what I'm seeing is this, Mark. They're still selling. Even your video production unit, guys here i had a chat with them before they brought up the uh, an article in the fin review that yesterday talked about you know the high end doing well yeah look that doesn't surprise me because at the moment asset classes people are a little bit nervous about the share market they think to themselves that it's overvalued then you've got you know office space retail big question marks i agree 100 percent with the content you put out there you go off and you look at these four lease signs on main strips big worry so a lot of people mark take advantage and exploit the capital gains tax free rule of principal place of residence. Hmm. So that doesn't surprise me. It's where a very lot of, juicy. Correct. You know, you buy something for 10 mil, you sell it for 15 mil, you pretty much don't pay tax, and you know, you pay a bit of legal fees, uh, agents, you know, there, but you've got five, you've got five million. As long know. as that's your principal place of residence, you're sweet. Correct. So all of a sudden I can see why that marketplace is still going okay and I can see a bunch of people leaving other countries saying Australia's safe well they've they've had 100 to 150 deaths right they're safe so you've got a few people that are freaking over COVID right and they're sort of saying okay Australia's safe but I am seeing I am seeing definite like I did 10 auctions last Saturday Mark like most sold but what you don't see is how much an owner had to reduce to get the property sold. Right. Right? So the clearance says 90%. But hang on a second. This guy paid $1 million. Well, I know. But there was one in Chippendale. He paid $1,850,000. He sold it for $1,650,000. That's a $200,000 loss. Yeah. That happened. It's yeah. a real transaction. Right. 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 That's a real deal. Raw data there. That's what. That's a property. That's what it sold for. So, so can I ask you a question, Tom? Just on that, not on that particular sale, but that just that day. Are you saying that um, the vendors are now meeting the market? Yeah. Yep. They're because meeting the market. Before they weren't. They were, there was a dis, uh, dysfunction. The vendors were not willing for what the buyers are willing to spend, but now the vendors are actually meeting the market. Yeah. Well, you know what it's like. You 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 meet you know you meet Mr. and Mrs. Papadopoulos, a Greek at Earlwood. I know what it's worth. Don't tell me. I'm not going to give it away. But all of a sudden, you're saying, hey, job peak was going. Yeah. Banks are going to stop their holidays. Yeah. Do you know what unemployment's doing? Yeah. And then all of a sudden, they're saying, okay, get me another 50000 and let's sell it, right? Right. That's what's changed. People sort of know if anything's going to happen. Look, there's a lot of people talking V-shape, right? Yeah. But... Then again, you turn around and you're beginning to have people think, hang on a second, for the, f well, give me, Mark, for the first time in my life, I know unemployed people. Yeah. I haven't known unemployed people. Yeah, me right? too, I'm the same. I know, and I, I know. There are people here that were on quarter of a million bucks yep. that are now on 750. Yeah. And it's going down to 600 soon. Yeah. Right? So it is real. Unemployment is real. And whether you like it or not, that is going to impact real estate because that's the buyer that we had. That's the seller that we have. And that's right? the person who's got a mortgage and, yeah. and that mortgage is going to have to start getting repaid soon. Correct. Very soon. 
Correct. And and, and I think we. I, mean, I think the government's done a great job. I mean, they they put us in a state of. Uh, they took our fear away for like six months, which is nice. Like they, that, that's a good thing. But eventually, they can't. They can't afford that. They can't do that forever. So what they're going to start doing? These things are going to start dropping off, which is what I got. What's being announced yesterday? Um, they're going to start dropping off, and as a result of it dropping off. Um, my view is, uh, I agree with you, I think real estate prices, the vendors are going to have to meet the market and that's meeting the market means the opposite of what it was 18 months ago <laughs> where the market was meeting them, they're now meeting the market, they're now pushing their prices down. So uh, is this, and the, are there any segments, I mean, for the opportunists out there, are there any segments in the market which are looking particularly good, like val- good value? Like are we talking about apartments that are looking particularly good value or houses in Asheville are looking particularly good value or places near the airport at Tullamarine? I mean, what are you seeing okay. or hearing? So here's what I'm seeing. There's no question about it. There are regional parts of Australia and rural parts for the first time that have got energy. Because what's happened is you've got an executive. He's been working in the city. His boss has said, listen, we're negotiating our lease. Our CFO is negotiating our lease. On their premises. On the premises. We don't need seven floors. Mm. We also don't need you to be coming in. And by the way, you won't be flying to Melbourne that often. You'll be using Zoom. We're changing things. You'll be working more from home. So this person's thinking, hang on a second. I'm living in the North Shore. I've always wanted to go live near you know, Bangalore or Byron Bay. So what they're doing is beginning the process of selling here and going to lifestyle areas. So we're seeing lifestyle areas. For the first time ever, Mark, like little hobby farms are taking off. There's a bunch of people here that are thinking, hey, I've got to get away from this inner city. So what we're seeing is regional areas, you know, Byron Bay, right? They're selling properties for more than the asking price. I'm talking to the agents really? there. Really? Yeah. Right? Good news. I've got a farm up there. you got a farm? Okay. You're in the money. You, you, you're, you're normally good with money. You pick the right spots. Okay. Then, then you turn around and you say, what's getting smashed? Units in complexes of hundreds and hundreds of units that have been built, that are sitting there. You know, they already copped it because of the bad publicity out in the that Homebush area with those projects. But now, oversupply, they're copying it. Um, what else is uh, what else is copying it? Um, generally speaking, um, units that um, a- a- any property that does that doesn't have five stars is also getting punished. The five star look, I've got to say, a property that's well positioned, a nice home, good spot, renovated within five or ten k's of the city is still getting is still getting the money right. It's all the others that aren't going. But I can't, Mark. I can't tell you. All of a sudden, things like you know, you can get incredible. I'll give you an example: property. Uh, uh, sh- you got the tenant as being Shell Coles out Marsden Park. You're getting a do the numbers. The loan's going to cost you two and a half percent. You're going to get a rental income of four hundred and thirty thousand bucks. That's the net rental income. Net. You've got a tenant that is basically bulletproof. You've got ten year leases with bank guarantors. Net rent is four thirty. Cost of money. 2.5, it's going to cost you 200000 You're making $230,000 a year. Goes into the bank account, you do nothing. Tenant pays for everything, right? Those rates, with all the chaos that we're going in, those rates are so low, you can make $230,000 if you've got the capacity to buy one of those properties and the banks give you the go-ahead. It's unheard of opportunities in those sectors, you know? Um of course, you've got to not get caught out and the underlying value of the land. Like in 10 years' time, you've got to get your fingers crossed the tenant wants to... Renew. Renew, you know. Um, but those things, are, those things are great opportunities at the moment, you know. So, it's, so I mean, I, by the way, I, I mean, I, I'm taking all this in myself because, I mean, I'm a, I'm a lover of real estate and, and particularly investing in real estate. It's very rare that um, I can get someone who's actually experienced but also neutral um, they're not trying to sell me something. Um, so hopefully hopefully, all you guys are listening to this this dude here because he knows what he's talking about. Can I ask you, I mean, I, we're going to run out of time, but I want to ask you something. What what do you think are some of the key mistakes that um, business owners or you know, it could be a mortgage broker running his own franchise or his own independent brokerage or a real estate agent, what is the mistake they seem to make often when they're trying to sell or 
probably, and they're not always just trying to sell the property to the buyer. Sometimes they're trying to sell the concept to the vendor that I could, please give me your place to sell. Yeah. Like, oh, that's their inventory. Yeah. What are the mm. most common mistakes they do as salespeople? What are they? Um, the first one would be that um, complacency creep comes in. There's a beautiful saying, nothing breeds failure like success. So when you're most successful is you become complacent. So what happens is the little things. You got an appointment at three o'clock to go look at that property to list it. You get there at five past three. Mm. Psychologically, there's a cross. You walk in and you make a lot of statements than asking questions. People think he cares more about himself than us, mm. right? So... That's the next one. So in other, can I just, in other words, they get in there, they're, they're shining their own badge up as opposed to asking you about the property that you've got for sale. Correct. I mean, who's the hero in the story? It's the customer, not the agent. Yeah. And in the last 10, 15 years, maybe it's got to do with the show Million Dollar Listing or all of that. Some of these real estate agents, I mean, they think they're the heroes yeah. in the equation, right? You know, all swank. You know, driving around, looking good like fashion models, you know, walking in. Totally. <laughs> right? So you've, got, so you've got a bit of that. The next thing is they don't solve a problem. Like at the end of the day, fundamentally, the way that Mark Burris is going to give Tom Panos some money is that if he feels the 100 bucks he gives me, he's going to get something back more than 100 bucks. So what happens is that they don't diagnose and find out what keeps that client up at night. Because here's a very important rule, Mark. People feel more pain losing a dollar than pleasure winning a dollar. Daniel Kahneman won the behavioral, uh, he won a prize, the, the Nobel Prize in 1979, studying that concept. People feel more pain losing a buck than pleasure winning a buck. So if a real estate agent goes in and says, I'll give you an example. If an agent goes in and says, give me $20,000 worth of marketing so I can market your property. I want to put it in the Wentworth Courier. I want to put it everywhere. The client's going to think, 20,000 bucks out of my pocket. <laughs> but if you said, Mr. Burris, What's more important to you, the risk of over-marketing by 20 grand or the risk of underselling by 500 grand? All of a sudden, the context changes. Yeah, the dynamic switches. <laughs> switches because you want to protect your asset. So I think a lot of great salespeople forget it's not about them. It's about the customer. And if you want to win share of wallet, you've got to win share of heart. And how do you get share of heart? You listen, you care, you solve a problem, you deliver a solution, and then the ultimate superpower is trust. It's your ultimate superpower. Because when there's trust in the relationship, the terms become negotiable. I can, like, I trust you. So if you ring me up about something, I don't go into the detail, right? Someone else I don't know, right? I don't trust them. I start probing. I want to find out more information. Trust is your superpower. And that's why I say, Mark, any salesperson that's watching this should understand the real secret is to have trust with the client long before you sit down to fill out the form. Because when there's trust in the relationship, everything flows. And when it comes to building trust, I mean, I'm, I'm a big advocate of that, by the way. And I, I, I'm glad you raised it. Um, trust is a funny thing. Um, the people we trust in our lives are not necessarily the right people, but they're the people we they're the things and the people we're the most f familiar with. Um, f for example, your family, and I trust my family because not so much that they're any be they're better than any other individuals out there, but because I know how they're going to react in certain circumstances. Correct. I know what I know what to expect. Yeah, it's predictable. And it's predictable, and it comes about by familiarity with them see me seeing them their whole life, of course, and me growing up with them, and them growing up with me, and me interacting with them. So. If you want your client to trust you, you've got to talk to your client. You've got to, you've got to see them. They, they've got to see you. They've got to know what you're about. Um, and it's, the social media is actually helping those regards because in, particularly if your client follows you because, and if you're giving good value out and you're expressing yourself well. By the way, all you people out there do stupid stuff on social media, that is the opposite to allowing your client to trust you. Be smart because they can, you can get Googled on anything.
So you make, make sure you're not there, stand there at a party, waving your hands through the air, pissed, and uh, you know, and you hopefully you're the same real estate agent that's trying to get this particular listing. Yeah. Is that right? I mean, yeah. and think then, about it. And then, and then Mark, so you, you you're out there, smashed off your face, posting on social media at Stereophonic or Sonic or some music festival. And then on your website, it's got down that you're part of Rotary, that you like giving back to your community. I mean, people know um, there's no connection between your audio and your video. What you're saying and what you're doing are two different things. 100%. But, but, you know, I just can't help. I'm even thinking about this right now. Right now, there are elderly people that are, that are you know, 60, 70, 80, 90 years of age that are at home. Some of them are spooked with COVID-19. And I think a good post... You know, instead of you posting yourself looking like a big shot, why don't you put a post there saying, hey, I want to let you know that I allocate five hours every week to help people in my local community get their errands done. Direct message me. If you need anything picked up at the shops, um, I'm around. I allocate every Thursday from 12 to 5, and I'm happy to do that. Totally. Right? There's, that's a good post. Serving the community, um, uh, 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 giving, helping, um, contributing that's the sort of stuff that stands out I mean that's I mean I, 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 just, I, I love that because you know there's no point saying I'm a writer because it does it's meaningless I mean, but but actually offering something tangible you can see it like you just suggested that's that's a great idea I, ju I just quickly want to go back to you said something before about you make 10 calls in the morning before 10 a.m. Um, do is your day structured do you structure your working days and do you stick to a – obviously you stick to your 10 calls before 10 a.m., but do you stick to your structure? Is it, how important is it is, or is it important to stick to your structure? Um, I don't operate like I'm at university or at high school where I've got 9 o'clock to 10 o'clock English, 10 o'clock to 11 mathematics, recess. I don't work that way. Mm -hmm. I've got a simple operating model, a.m., p.m. A.m., my energy's higher, Mark. I'm, you know, I seem to have more energy in the morning. Same. So AM, I do a little bit more my sales type of activities. So my 10 calls before 10 AM are split up between three new business calls, three current client calls, three culture calls, people within my organization, and then I allow one family call. My family calls are, you know, to... Uh, generally to my mum or, or to my dad. You know, I speak to my mum a lot more. Of, she's, she's being a Greek mum. She's grieving 10x with the loss of my brother, right? So me sort of, you know, being there on the phone, you know, um, helps a lot. So, so AM, I do those calls. Um, AM, I'm pitching for, for business because I still pitch. I mean, I, I, I simply know, I mean, there's a law of replacement. The law of replacement says you're always going to lose clients. And you told me this in 2006 because I remember writing it down on my notes. Don't assume growth all the time. Mm. Don't, I remember it. Don't assume growth mm. all the time. And I know that at any minute there's a young girl or guy who's hungrier than me, mm. who's pretty smart, and who's looking in the distance and saying he's getting cocky. He's getting complacent. And I do lose clients. It's business. So what you do is called the law of replacement. And the law of replacement says I must always be adding potential clients to my pipeline because I'm always losing clients. At, the, at least at the same rate as Correct. the loss. Correct. So if you've got 100 clients and you're losing 10 a year, you've got to be at least replacing with 10 to maintain your 100. Spot on. Yeah, and, and you need to know that the, that law. And what, I'll tell you something very interesting in the way – Tom's expression, it's, it's very um, authoritative. And it would go back to him, you know, he's to some extent he's establishing himself in front of you guys. I mean, the way he's doing it, he's expressing his authority. And it's just a good lesson for you. He's a pro, okay? But he calls some of these tips about the law of replacement, the law of re reciprocity. <laughs> so the moment he puts the words law of, in front of something, it looks like, wow, that's very persuasive. That's really good use of language. Correct? Correct. And, and it's, 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 you've got to get your head around this shit. Yeah. That's really important. People got to understand this. You're, 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 listen, you're spot on because the word, the connotation law is that this thing here is official, mm. right? This is official. You're, 
you got a high IQ. I said it to you off camera on the other interview that we're doing. You got a high IQ, so you go off and you decipher what I'm saying. But 100%, I'll be sitting there at a Zoom webinar with people or at a conference, and I'll say, here are the seven irrefutable laws of success in this market. The pens go up yep. straight away, yep. right? Panos is speaking. This is this is a law, right? Compare that to, hey, I think at the moment. What you sort of got to um, got to be doing? I'm like, guessing. You, yeah, you know, it's wishy washy. You know? totally and when you're talking to your client who you're trying to sell to, or, or you're trying to engage with, yeah. you've got to come across with this language. One hundred percent. These are the things that we've seen in our business in the suburb of Bankstown in the last six months in Spot terms on. of sales that have occurred. These are the seven things. Correct. Correct. Everyone's going. Whoa, hang on. This guy, he's an authority. Correct. Straight up. There's an example. You could say the same if you're a mortgage broker. I don't care what you're selling. It's the same deal. That's a real life example of authority or establishing authority. Tom Panos, I don't have enough time. I could talk to you for hours. This guy's a legend, not only because of his resilience, and uh, but it, just the way he expresses himself, what he knows about selling, what he knows just generally about business. I mean, you really are a legend, mate. And uh, I'm proud to say you're my friend. I appreciate your time. Time is valuable, um, particularly for blokes like us. We're getting on a bit. Um, our time becomes more valuable. Mm. And uh, he's sharing it with us today. And for that, I'm extraordinarily appreciative. Thanks very much, mate. Thank you. You're, mate, I've got to tell you, you're the legend because you don't know from afar the amount of people that you have, let's call it virtually, we'll use that word now, mentored or inspired because i got to tell you there's something special about having a evidence-based person a track model that's done it so there's plenty of people that are watching guy at punch bowl right nothing special in the upbringing didn't necessarily win the birth lottery and went to cranbrook from a young age and then what happens is they turn around and say it's been done. It's like the four minute mile. It's been done. We can do it. And there's plenty of people out there, plenty of young Greek guys that have sat there that have said, Burris has done it. I'm having a crack. Thanks, Tom. Appreciate it, mate.